Coincidentally, his origins were North Carolina. We don't talk about the years that he spent in New York City. We don't talk about his family's background. He is seen as a product of North Carolina. So he's very much part of this post-racial fantasy, this bootstraps or shoestrings narrative as someone who can pull themselves up by their shoestrings. And he became the quintessential race man, one who countered those fears and anxieties that we saw in 1984 when David Stern took over. So we have David Stern, we have NBC, we have Nike all coming together to foster this new narrative around the league, a narrative that played into those narratives that were coming out of political circles in terms of the Reagan revolution, in terms of the importance of families. So Jordan's, you know, up until the day his father was murdered, his strength, his talents on and off were often linked to his father, not his mother. So we see that narrative playing out in important ways. Yet we also see a movement developing at the same time as well. So in 1984, Curtis Blow, one of hip-hop's most important pioneers, released his single, Basketball, crystallizing the connection between hip-hop and basketball that remains in place today. And we can see that from everything from Run DMC to the Fab Five to Allen Iverson. Sorry, Shaq, to your rap album. And we see it in terms of cultural performances. We see it in terms of aesthetics. We see it in terms of style. Michigan's Fab Five and their black socks and their shaved heads and their long shorts. We see its influence from players. But we also see a league that sought to profit, that sought to make money off of its own ideas of hip-hop. And so here are two examples. Video game cover from NBA Street Volume 2, in case you missed Volume 1, and a halftime performance. And so this is the kind of inscriptions of hip-hop that we see in the NBA through the late 80s into the 90s. And we see an effort to sanitize that. So Allen Iverson appears on the cover of Hoop Magazine. We love you, Allen Iverson, but we're going to airbrush out your tattoos. We see an effort to repackage hip-hop in a way that will both attract urban, primarily black and Latino youth, but also won't alienate white fans and corporate sponsors. Chris Broussard described hip-hop in the early 80s, into the 90s, and even into 2005 as follows. I'm going to just quote a little bit. It's a brilliant assessment, but it's very long. The men, hairy, fat, mostly white, knocking on the door of middle age, dancing without shame or rhythm, to Snoop Dogg's Drop It Like It's Hot. More than 18,000 Bulls fans roar as the Matadors back their things up before the closing with a deep voice dance. This is what timeouts often look like in the NBA of 2005, and I would say in 2000 and 1995. Adults, kids, or mascots throwing the latest hip-hop moves to the latest hip-hop tracks. Shorts, which once covered nothing but jock straps, cover everything but caps. Samples, not organs, flare, and not just during game breaks, but game action. Headlines of the league's publications, inside stuff, shout, illest, chillin', and play it. And yes, hip-hop is as much part of the NBA landscape as early entry. And this was not good to many white fans. They shake their heads at brash teenage rookies who make arrogant stares, an essential follow-up to dunks and crossovers. After Ron Artest, who happens to hail from hip-hop's hallowed Queens Rip Projects in New York City, went buck wild in Detroit. It's actually not Detroit, it's Auburn Hills. 
I mean, it's really important because people often frame the, 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 the fight, which I'll talk about in a minute, as being in Detroit uh, and as a way to racialize. Uh, it is in one of the most racially homogeneous parts of Detroit, as many stadiums are. And you have commentators who responded to the palace brawl at, by saying things like this. Detroit is more dangerous than Fallujah. As a way not to talk about what's going on in the palace of Auburn Hills, but to play into larger narratives about Detroit. So, Chris Mutsar finishes by saying that Lee Concho winced as the nation connected the brawl to hip hop. And what they did, instead of challenging the efforts to connect hip hop to the brawl, the efforts to connect uh, blackness to the brawl, was say, what needs to change is the players. There was a desire to create the next Michael Jordan. And if they couldn't find the next Michael Jordan organically, they would create him through dramatic transformations in the league. And so what I found, and what the book really focuses on, was that in this post uh, our test environment, the league was talked about as being overrun by thugs, gangsters, criminals, and worse. And just to back up a little bit for those who don't know, the Palace Brawl was an event that happened in 2004. Ben Wallace, uh, the Detroit Pistons, uh, and Ron Artest of the Indiana Pacers got into an NBA fight, which is a push, a shove, a bunch of guys standing around, and announcers going crazy. Uh, and that's really what happened. Uh, but Ron Artest did something that uh, Skylar Granfrey really emphasizes in his work, is he retreated and he lied across the scorer's table. And according to Grant Fareed, and I, I would agree with this, that was the ultimate transgression. He put his body at rest. And in the NBA and in society at large, a black body is only a productive body when it's in motion, when it's at work, when it's producing uh, for the league, for the larger institutions. And so while he was lying there, a fan threw a cup that hit him. He then proceeded to go into the stands uh, and throw a punch, other players follow suit, and then fans went onto the court, chairs were thrown, lots of yes. And the whole world stopped in terms of the NBA. So literally, all of these things that developed in the post test landscape brought all of these fears, anxieties, racial narratives that we saw in the, in the 1980s back into focus. The league was no longer defined by Michael Jordan and post-racial harmony and one players pulling themselves up by their shoestrings. They were defined by Ron Artest. We see this, this joke from David Letterman. Ron Artest of the Indiana Pacers has been suspended for the rest of the season by the NBA for brawling with the fans. The good news is he's been named to host next year's Bible Awards. So very much linking the criminality, the danger, and the violence of the NBA with hip hop. So what we get is a dramatic transformation in the league. So the league reacted by imposing a dress code, by uh, mandating age restrictions so players could no longer go straight from high school uh, into the league, uh, by cracking down on trash talking, physical play, and really any form of individuality. I mean, this actually didn't make it, uh, I didn't spend a lot of time in the book, but there was a backlash and an NBA uh, crackdown on compression shorts. That there was this move among players to wear uh, compression shorts under their shorts, and the league didn't like it. They didn't like players asserting their individual uh, power. And so the league said no. Or someone like Tino Mobley, uh, then of uh, the Sacramento Kings, He's just been traded. He's getting interviewed, and he's wearing a, a bead.